reading today from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 31. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Please be seated. We've been... Um, kind of hanging around in the vicinity of Romans chapter 3 for a while now because there's lots there, just so much that we could cover, but also because there's been some breaks in all of this with the Advent season and with me being away and Pastor Greg preaching in December and then again for a couple of weeks here in January. So just one more time before we move on, I want to let the text speak for itself. We'll just walk through this. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, for since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And I really don't think that we can overstate this, that we can emphasize it too much, or that we can say it too often. The first purpose of God's law is to be a mirror of the perfect righteousness of God. That's why when the psalmist looked into it, he declared, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight, that in which he finds full pleasure and satisfaction, is the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And the psalmist could write this, because he knows something that's so very often missed by people in our day who think that, well, the law, that was then. The psalmist understood that only the one who understands you could never be saved by the law is able to see it for what it is and is able to meditate on it and in meditating on the law of God, see the perfections of God. Once again, I believe we need to take firm hold on this because it is a very very common thing today for people to just impugn the law of God. And there are so many different catchphrases that they use when they do this. We're under grace, not law, they say. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And these things are true. Both of those statements happen to come from scripture itself. But they're only true when they're taken in their full context. And their full context is the entirety of God's word. Think about this. The very same scripture that says the letter kills says in another place, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And since both of these statements come from the same author, the Holy Spirit of God at the end, there can be no contradiction. God does not speak in two different voices. He doesn't say one thing in the Old Testament and then change that and speak in a different way in the New. The psalmist was saved by grace through faith and not by works of the law, just as we are. And that's why he was able to look at the law and say, I love it. It is more precious than gold, it is sweeter than honey from the comb, and it is the delight of the blessed man. 
another approach that some take is to say, well, shouldn't we just look to Jesus? We don't need the law. We don't need the Old Testament. We know there's a popular preacher who a few years ago now said we should just unhitch from that. Shouldn't we just look to Jesus, someone might ask. And of course, the answer is yes, we should. We should look to Jesus always. But we cannot look to Jesus merely as an example of what it looks like to be good. As if Jesus was walking around during the time that he was here in Galilee and Judea and doing those good things that he was just motivated out of the kindness of his heart. Scripture does tell us on occasion he was moved with compassion, so certainly there was feeling behind that. But what Jesus was doing was being obedient to the will of his Father. He said, I can't do anything unless God gives it to me to do. I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus' life perfectly reflected the goodness of God And that's the goodness that we find revealed in his law. That's why Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. The Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, is the story of Jesus. It points to him. It leads us inexorably to him. And it did then and it does now. So do not attempt to denigrate or impugn the law of God by somehow trying to set God's revelation of himself in Christ in opposition to his revelation of himself in his holy word. Again, God does not speak with contradictory voices. We cannot look to the law. We cannot look to the testimony, to the word of God, and say, well, that was then. That's how they understood this issue long, long time ago. We know better now. We don't need that sure and certain word of God. We cannot do that or we do it at our peril. Yes, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. But he went on to say, although the law and the prophets bear witness to that righteousness of God. A more word-for-word translation reads, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. This is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And indeed, as the writer to the Hebrews said, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, that would be the law, by the way, And every transgression or disobedience under the law received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? See, sometimes we say, well, the law was harsh, the law was heavy, the law was difficult. No wonder people couldn't keep it. But we have grace, which is ever so much easier. The writer to Hebrews, who may or may not have been Paul, said, you know what, if every transgression received its due penalty under the law, which was inferior, how much more under the gospel? How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Which is a question that we should keep in mind throughout the book of Romans. Whether or not Paul actually wrote Hebrews, I believe he would have appreciated the characterization of his gospel as such a great salvation, as should we. This great salvation, which is ours, is nothing less than the righteousness of God. I want you to think about that. It's not our weak and feeble righteousness our attempts as human beings to somehow try to measure up. It is the very righteousness of God himself. Talk about a great salvation. This is not God accepting some lesser standard. God saying, I know you couldn't keep the law, so I'm going to provide a different way. And it's certainly not God letting us define our own standard of goodness and righteousness. This is God imputing to us his very own righteousness, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That's all, Jew and Gentile. 
slave and free, male and female, old and young, all who believe. For there is no distinction, none whatsoever. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. I should read it again, but we've read it a lot in the last few months. It's kind of the whole book of Romans summarized in a single sentence. All have sinned and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. But to further clarify, we have the rest of verses 25 and 26. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Now the sacrifices and ceremonies of the law always pointed to Christ. I hope we've got that clear now. And as we've already seen, the saints of the old covenant were saved by grace through faith just as we are. There is only one way of salvation. There has only ever been one way of salvation. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And we shouldn't play word games and try to figure out how you can come to the Father through Jesus without actually even knowing Jesus. That's foolishness. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Saints of the Old and the New Covenant are all saved by grace through faith. But because Christ had not yet died, under the Old Covenant, God is attributing to them in time and space this same righteousness which would remain to be purchased at the cross of Calvary. But it was promised by God in the law and in the prophets God promised redemption through his son, and we know that God always keeps his promises. So the moment that it was spoken, it was as good as done. And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. See this putting forth of Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received through faith, was, according to Romans, for this purpose, to show God's righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, we have the means of this great salvation, propitiation, the satisfaction of God's wrath through the blood of Christ. That's the means by which God accomplishes this. We also have the method. This great salvation can be received in no other way than by faith in Jesus Christ, which comes through the grace of God. Now we have the motive. This was to show God's righteousness. We see the same reason put forward in that other great passage about salvation by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, where Paul wrote, And you were dead. Just then, in the trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Our salvation was accomplished by Christ so that God could demonstrate the full extent of his glory, of his love, of his mercy, of his grace in the ages to come as we look back and see the price that was paid. Yes, of course, salvation by grace through faith is of inexpressibly great benefit to us. We sing about it, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. If you were here at the funeral yesterday, what a scary thing. But now 
am found. I was blind, but now I see. Our salvation is an amazing blessing to us, but it's not about us. It's for the glory of God and God alone. It was accomplished so that in the coming ages, God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So having stated God's means, God's method, and God's motive for this great salvation, which is ours through faith in Jesus Christ, Paul goes on into another series of questions. We're only going to focus on the first one this morning because they all follow from that first one. Romans chapter 3, verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? We ought to wonder why that question is even necessary after Paul's great exposition of salvation by the free and sovereign grace of God and God alone. How could we dare? But evidently the question is necessary because sin runs so deep in the human heart that we have the temerity to presume that we might by some means save ourselves or even just participate in the process. There are those who believe that's simply a matter of being good or doing good. Those who think that through the law comes the checklist for human righteousness. If I just put a box next to every one of those commandments and start ticking them off whenever I keep them, then that's righteousness, that's holiness on my part. Instead of the law actually revealing the depth of our sin in the light of God's absolute and perfect holiness, which was what it was given to do. But in this mistaken view, we approach the Ten Commandments as if it's kind of a test, maybe a final exam that when we get to heaven and we stand at the pearly gates and St. Peter starts talking to us, well, if we have kept them more often than we have broken God's commandments, maybe we'll be okay. Maybe if we can just say, well, you know, I, I've done this and this and this and this, but that's only four out of ten, so that's 60%. That's still a passing grade, right? But through the law... Through the commandments of God comes the knowledge of sin, and by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. So it's kind of a pass-fail, really, and we all fail. What of faith, then? Isn't faith still something that we have to do? Doesn't God finally come to the conclusion that no one will ever be able to keep his laws if he would have thought that or ever planned for that. And because of that, now, in lieu of perfect obedience under the law, he's willing to accept the non-meritorious work of faith. And the simple answer to that is no, he does not. Faith is not something that we do. It's often portrayed that way, but that is not true. Faith is something that God does in us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, this faith, this believing, this trusting in Christ alone is not your own doing. It doesn't come from you, it is the gift of God. But isn't it still a decision that we have to make of our own free will? And again, no. I remember as a young person hearing the story of a man named Charles Blunden who was known for, among other things, walking across the Niagara Gorge on a tightrope about 160 feet above the water. For those of you who have been there, he did this in the vicinity of the Rainbow Bridge, so maybe you can picture where that is. And on at least one occasion, maybe more, he did this while carrying his manager on his back, piggyback, across that tightrope, back and forth, over the gorge. And as a sermon illustration, the way that got sort of turned is that faith is kind of like when Blondin came back to his fans waiting there on the side and he said, how many of you believe that I could do that again? 
And they all, yes, absolutely. We know you can do it. Go for it. And then he said, okay, so who's willing to get on my back and let me take them for a walk? And faith was portrayed as that willingness to climb on his back. And it's likened to that idea and that, that tract that was out for a long time, that Jesus will carry us on his back across that great chasm of sin that separates us from God if only we will choose to get on his back and let him. A similar illustration that I remember from my childhood had us at the bottom of a very, very deep well with steep, slimy sides. And we're down there with two broken legs, completely unable to climb out or otherwise extricate ourselves. And then Jesus comes along and he lowers us a rope. And all we have to do is grab hold and let, us, let him pull us to the top. But here's the thing. The part about us being completely unable to climb out or otherwise extricate ourselves is true. Absolutely true. But not because we're sick in sin. Not because we're severely injured in our sin there at the bottom of the well. Rather, you, Paul says, y'all, we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Paul's complimenting us by saying that outside of Christ, we follow Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And at that time, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The common wisdom in some of those old Humphrey Bogart gangster films said that dead men tell no tales but you know what else dead men don't do they don't make decisions for Christ they don't climb on someone's back and they don't take hold of ropes or any other means of deliverance that might be proffered so in John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, we have that amazing statement of God's great love. Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Hallelujah. But we need verse 13. Who were born not of blood. I know, I shouldn't bring this up because I'm not. But you know, you hear that statement once in a while, if you're not Dutch, fill in the blank, whatever. Other people feel that way about their ethnicity too, and it's all stupid. <laughs> but it's not of blood. It's not of our descent from Christian parents or Christian families or a Christian nation or anything of the kind. We are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. It's not a decision that we make of our own free will, we actually have no free will. Our will is bound to sin. And it's not of the will of man. It is of God. John writes, Our great salvation is not based on a human decision any more than it is based on works of righteousness that we have done. It is just not possible. Some of you might want to say what I'm about to relate would never happen but trust me it does and it has I have sat and had this conversation with people doesn't the fact that we have come to understand and believe the gospel mean at the very least that we're just a little bit wiser or a little bit smarter than those who don't no, <laughs> may never be. The natural person, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. We can proclaim the true and certain word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, all day long to an unregenerate person and unless the Holy Spirit does his work in their heart. 
unless he opens their ears to hear and opens their heart to receive and regenerates them, bringing them from death to life, imparting faith to them, it will never have any effect. Because even the word of God, especially the word of God is folly. To unbelievers, it is spiritually discerned. So coming back to our question, what becomes of our boasting? Well, Paul said it is excluded. It's interesting the way he said it, what becomes of our boasting. He kind of assumes that it's something we do. And that's true, it is something that we do. He says, but that's excluded. You're not allowed to do that. Why is it excluded? By what kind of law? By a law of works? Well, no. If it was a law of works, then there would be room for us to say, well, I may not be quite as good as Jesus, but I'm certainly better than some people. It's not excluded by a law of works. It's excluded by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Sheer grace, as our catechism says, nothing else. Grace plus nothing. Christ plus nothing. God's mercy plus nothing of your own doing. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast ever. Believers may not boast over unbelievers. Certainly not. What do you have that you have not been given as a gift of God's grace? Gentiles may not boast over Jews. Later on in Romans, Paul's going to talk about how God cut them out of an olive tree so that we could be grafted in. But he says, don't boast yourself over them. If God cut them out and grafted you in, he could just as easily cut you out and graft them back in. Sinners, may not, or saints, may not boast over sinners. That one should be obvious, but never mind that. Saints may not boast over other less mature saints. It is excluded. No boasting allowed. There is no going to the mirror of God's law. And it doesn't mean much for me, but some of you primping a little bit and then stepping away thinking, "Uh uh-huh, I look pretty good. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. What then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. Zero boasting allowed. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. This great salvation that we possess is the work of God, first, last, and always, always has been, always will be. We are his workmanship. We sing it in some of our hymns, I am the potter, you are the clay, but we never stop to think about the implications of it. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't become his workmanship through good works. We do good works because we are his workmanship. All this and always for the glory of God alone. Now I just want to say, if you're hearing this and thinking, huh, I thought I was saved because I prayed a prayer in five-day club a long time ago and I asked Jesus into my heart. More common, maybe in Reformed churches, I thought I was saved because I was baptized and I made profession of faith and I was received into church membership. God forbid, I thought I was saved because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and by the way, people like me. If you're hearing this, and that's you, you're wondering, I don't know now. Am I even saved? Well, then I want you to ask yourself one simple question. Do I believe that I am a sinner? Really and truly. Not just, you know, the words we use, those euphemisms to go back to yesterday again. I have my flaws, I have my weaknesses. 
do I believe that I am a sinner, a cosmic rebel against the holy will of God Almighty. And furthermore, do I believe that because I am dead and tre- in my tre- or was dead in my trespasses and sins, that it is only out of sheer grace earned for me by the death of Christ that God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus? So kind of a two-part question. Do I understand that I am a sinner? And do I understand that my only hope of salvation is found in Christ alone. If you do, you could say, yes, I, I get it. I get both of those things and there's nothing to fear. Put away all trust, all confidence in your own efforts. They can't do you any good anyway. Cast yourself wholly on the mercy of God and know that because you trust in Christ alone, you belong to him. That's a gift of his grace. And you belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death. We're going to sing in just a moment. Tis not for works that we have done. Not at all, not in any way. These all to him we owe, But he of his electing love salvation does bestow. The hymn writer went on to say, therefore, to you, O Christ, alone is due all glory and renown. No merit of our own we claim. No boasting allowed. Because it robs him of his crown. You were our only surety in God's redemption plan in you. His grace, God's grace was given us before the world began. What a great salvation we have through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus.